So what are we going to cover today? Uh, we're going to give an overview of, of the Workspaces service. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, WorkDocs and how it integrates with, uh, with Workspaces. We'll move into a, uh, an overview of AppStream 2.0. And then we'll talk about Active Directory integration for the two services. We'll talk about how we, uh, we grant access to corporate resources and go over some reference models for that. And we'll kind of bring everything together with uh, hopefully a demo, although the, uh, the kickoff to the open slide there kind of makes me a little worried if the demo gods are already angry. Uh, we'll bring everything together, kind of show what, uh, what it looks like to build some solutions with both Workspaces and AppStream together. So um, just a little bit of background in the end user computing space. We're seeing evolving, an evolving uh, workforce, a lot of changes in, in what motivates people, what they're looking for in, uh, in the IT work fit workplace. Uh, surveys show that 43% of employees worked remotely at least part of the time in 2016. That was up uh, pretty dramatically from, from six years prior. 50% uh, of millennials factor ability to work remotely into decisions on, uh, on where they're going to work. 65% of employees have expressed a preference for, for flexible um, remote work uh, agreements, and employees who work remotely have shown on, on average 20 to 60% uh, more engagement. At the same time, organizations are becoming more dynamic. Uh, 2017 saw $3.7 trillion in global acquisitions and mergers. Uh, as businesses operate globally, they need IT to match that, uh, that, that dyna dynamic uh, approach, and they need to project their presence across the world. And then there's, as always, a, a pressing focus on security. Security threats have been a, a major concern for, for many years. And in 2017, the average data breach cost $3.62 million. Uh, WannaCry ransomware alone across the industry um, ran up a, a tab of $4 billion. Customers are telling us that uh, they're increasingly looking for novel solutions to address these uh, business imperatives. The ability to embrace personal devices, which uh, we've all heard referred to as bring your own device. In the early days, we all probably talked about it as bring your own disaster. <clears throat> We want to be able to support those contract workers, so flexible workforces, people coming in and leaving the company without having to do a whole lot of, to go through a whole lot of effort to manage those assets. Uh, provide better access for mobile workers. So where uh, uh, the traditional workday used to be nine to five, spent it, that's a thing of the past. We broke that. We all created remote access solutions. You don't even get a snow day anymore. That's on us, all of us. So, uh, so people are looking for ways to extend that mobile access to different platforms, to be able to use it on tablets, on phones, on, on any type of device um, that, uh, from any location, all while remaining secure and agile. So uh, in the past, we've addressed the end-user compute market with personal computers and on-prem VDI. With personal computers, you're managing inventory. Um, BYOD is complicated. Uh, how, how do you manage that user data? How do you make sure that those important pieces are backed up? It takes a, a lot of money to scale in, uh, in personal computing. If you want to you know, add 1,000 people for Q4 that spin off in Q1, what do you do with that hardware? It's just going to sit in the closet and continue to depreciate. And then on-premises VDI requires a huge upfront investment. It takes we weeks. Weeks to deploy, it takes months to deploy, if you're lucky. It requires heavy management, those servers have to be uh, uh, secured and sourced, it's expensive to scale and manage. And then as we build these complex solutions, we're storing data across multiple, de multiple devices with limited control. How do users access those large files and collaborate uh, across those different devices? So that's where AWS end user compute solutions comes in. So we already know you're probably an AWS customer. You wouldn't be here. You're comfortable with what a lot of you consider to be the traditional AWS workloads, web applications, database hosting, and so on. Well, you can get a lot of the same benefits with um, end user computing in the AWS cloud. We have a desktop and application strategy that provides access to applications and flexible desktops uh, available anywhere. So overview of the services, we'll start with workspaces been around for a little bit longer. Workspaces is really that traditional full desktop in the cloud, what you think of as, as VDI, right? Your users can have admin rights or not. It's a standard Windows endpoint. Um, it works with your existing management tools, the existing knowledge that, uh, that your administrators have. It's a pay-as-you-go model. You're paying only for what you use with no upfront investments in building that, uh, that infrastructure to manage the systems. No specialized skills required beyond what you already do for Windows administration today. 
We have monthly and, billing, uh, monthly and hourly billing options available, and I'll get a little bit more into detail on that later on. Um, and then uh, you know, we, we've built it to be simple to manage and deployed. There's a, a full set of APIs, SDKs. You can integrate workspaces in with your existing workflows, with your existing service portals, uh, lots of, of options for that. You're seeing consistent scale and, and performance across those workspaces. Each user gets a persistent workspace environment that has the same capability as the, the next user. They are individual instances for, uh, for each user. We're not you know, sharing those, those instances out. Um, you know, one user has allocated a, a, a particular instance. If I disconnect today and log in tomorrow, whatever I was doing is still there, still running on that desktop. Workspaces is really there to end that PC lifecycle treadmill, that two to four year uh, refresh cycle that just faded away. With Workspaces, you're able to extend the life of that client hardware, where today your average asset life cycles, I'd say around that four year mark, where you're starting to depreciate and do hardware replacements. Uh, you could take that same hardware and use it to continue to access workspaces in the background without, uh, without needing to upgrade that equipment to be able to get that full uh, featured experience. Workspaces supports those bring your own device models. And it's a, it's a full Windows desktop behind the scenes, so you're not trying to support BYOD with a selection of mobile apps and managing some versions for Mac and different versions for Windows. You can use PCs, Mac OS, tablets, Chromebooks, and Zero clients, and that's uh, where you can really see some cost reductions come in. Uh, a personal story I always use there, my, uh, my brother uh, does engineering in, in Missouri. And he has a, uh, uh, runs AutoCAD on his notebook. It was a $6,000 notebook. And he was telling me, he's like, I'm always up on these bridges. And I'll be working, uh, you know, re referring to the engineering diagrams, looking at uh, the papers. And he's like, I'm always, I'm always worried I'm going to slip and I'm going to knock the thing off. And because I know it costs so much, I'm going to dive for it instead of just yelling, look out, right? So with, uh, with workspaces, he's able to run a GPU workspace on a $130 Chromebook. I mean, worst case that happens there is it smashes into bits on the ground, hopefully misses everybody, but uh, not, not that same level of concern. He doesn't have that same feeling of, oh, I've got to protect these corporate resources, which, you know, I wouldn't die for any uh, value, uh, value workspace, but my brother's a little different. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a way to provide that high-end capability on that low-end device. Um, workspaces, again, support self-service. So we have a full API to, to allow users to do you know, rebooting, rebuilding, request them, um, you know, get rid of them, request additional workspaces for development environments. You can quickly scale up and down without any investments. And, uh, and again, they are perpetual, so they let you run in the cloud on that OpEx model. Use cases for workspaces. Uh, really, workspaces can run anywhere today where you're currently using a full Windows desktop. Uh, projects in the end user space, I mean, they tend to take some time. It's not a, not a rip and replace solution. You're going to start with a couple of use cases here and there and, uh, and grow your use as you find um, you know, how these products really kind of fit into your environments. Um, but uh, some of the early places that we see workspaces coming in are, are things for temporary workers or contractors. Um, really great use case is the, uh, the contractor environment. When I started at, oops, microphone there. Uh, when I started at, uh, at Amazon, I was in professional services. And uh, I had five or six different customers. Prior to the lease of, uh, of workspaces, we had a lot of them that had security practices and postures that required that to operate on their network, you used their hardware with their security tools, their management products, and so on. So I'd go home at night, and I'd be like, all right, where am I going tomorrow? OK, I guess i got to bring these three, right? It was a, uh, a lot to, to work with and manage. But with workspaces, I can bring my own asset, connect to a guest network, or work through a, a cell cellular modem. And I can access those secure endpoints for individual companies, uh, run what I need to run, access the data on their network on a device that they know is secure um, because it's accessing via the workspace. Uh, use in training environments is another, another great use case. In fact, if you just go right through that wall there, uh, you'll see the hands-on labs. That environment was fully delivered via workspaces, and, and that's how we've built it for the last five years. That's kind of one of the reasons I became a workspace specialist, but that is a story for another time. Uh, we've used those uh, uh, workspaces to deliver hands-on labs and certification environments at reInvent and at the summits in, uh, in North America, um, like I said, for the last five years. Um, other areas, you know, we've, got, uh, we've got some examples where, uh, where Amazon uh, workspaces are used throughout the corporate environment, uh, sometimes as a bastion host, so Caltech's uh, Gutman Labs 
use workspaces as a, ba as a bastion into some of their high-performance computing environments. And I'll get into a couple of other uh, customer use cases in a little bit here. Workspaces work with your existing tools, your existing knowledge. Um, they, they tie into your, uh, to your intranet. Um, management of those devices, again, their standard Windows endpoints is via Active Directory. You can use group policy. Um, they respect standard AD permissions. Um, we can, you can use multi-factor authentication solutions for that, uh, that tie into standard radius solutions. So anything that uses a, a time-based uh, protocol, the TOTP um, tokens. So that's um, things like authenticators, uh, Gemalto tokens, semantic VIP. Okta has a, a, a solution that, uh, that will push to an application. Uh, you can manage those endpoints with SCCM for configuration changes, for inventory, for software distribution. And then we've, uh, we've recently released a, uh, an ability to ensure that the endpoints are managed by a certificate authority. So for Windows clients and OS X clients, you can um, push a certificate to those systems and only allow uh, systems that have that endpoint certificate to connect to your workspaces environment. Workspaces, the security is, is one of Amaz is Amazon's absolute top priority for, uh, for everything we do, everything we develop. Uh, workspaces is no, uh, uh, no change to that. There's no sensitive data stored on a user device. So when I connect to my workspace with the workspaces client, there's no data that's synchronizing between the systems. When I disconnect from that workspace, the data is, you know, that connection's gone. You have no access to those corporate resources. Uh, workspaces data can be encrypted at rest. That's a, an option uh, today. You can encrypt the user volume and the data volume. It's a simple checkbox. Integrates with, with KMS. You can use our keys. You can bring your own. Up to you how you want to, uh, how you want to handle that. And then the, the stream is encrypted in transit. Our protocol uses Teradici's PC over IP protocol. It's AES 256 based encryption for, the, for the, uh, the stream. You're passing bits down to the client. You're passing keystrokes and mouse movement up. Workspaces meets a, a number of uh, compliance protocols. So we're PCI DSS level one compliant, SOC one and two, ISO 9001 and, and 2701. Uh, we're HIPAA eligible with a business associate agreement. And um, we are EU GDPR ready, as are all AWS services, uh, when GDPR becomes enforceable on May 25th of this year. Billing options for workspaces include both hourly and, and monthly. Um, so monthly is really best for your full-time staff, anybody that's going to be using the workspace for more than about 82 hours a, uh, a month. It simplifies your bill. It gives you instant access. And the, the little difference here, you'll see instant access versus quick access on hourly. So with, a, uh, with an always-on workspace, it's always running, just waiting for that connection in the background. When you try to make the connection, it takes on average four to six seconds to get that, uh, that connection to a desktop. It's running. It's there. It's great for running scheduled tasks, long-running jobs. If you need to run a, a data model before you go home, you start it on your workspace, you run home, you want to check the job when you get there, it stays running because that is an always-on workspace. For the hourly workspaces, that's going to be based on when the user's connected. After a user disconnects, you set a timeout period. When that uh, user's been disconnected, let's say you set the timeout for an hour, they've been disconnected for an hour, that workspace will hibernate. So now, to reconnect to that workspace after it's hibernated, takes about a minute and a half to two minutes. If the user connects before that hibernation kicks in, say you shut it down, you're at your desk, you move to a meeting, um, it, you know, it takes you six minutes to get across campus, you sit down, pop up the uh, notebook, reestablish your connection to your notebook, it's going to be that same instant connection because it's still running. And again, the break-even point for uh, hourly versus monthly is uh, about 82 hours. We do offer a workspaces cost optimizer. You can find that on the uh, AWS Solutions website. It's a set of Lambda scripts. I think it costs less than a dollar to run um, for a month. And it will automatically inventory um, your connection times. It'll monitor the connection times based on the CloudWatch metrics for your users. And it will make either recommendations for which, uh, which workspaces to do as hourly and which users to, to set as always on. Or you can actually have the cost optimizer just manage that environment. So it'll make those changes for you. So customers, uh, obviously, one of the, uh, the, the, the key pieces is that customers like the solutions that we're putting out. We want them to love the solutions that we're, we're delivering. This is a success story from Endemol Shine Nederland. So for those of you who aren't familiar, they are a world-leading creator, um, producer, and distributor of multi-platform entertainment. Includes uh, American Idol, Big Brother, MasterChef, Man vs. Food, and uh, uh, The Biggest Loser in Wipeout. 
have a large number of part-time and temporary uh, workers. So as they do these contract jobs, on-site on jobs, they, they bring in a lot of uh, local workforce. So with workspaces, they can provide those new workers with a Windows desktop and the applications they need within hours instead of days. Workspaces makes it easier for those users to use their preferred device and for Endemol uh, Shine Nederland to maintain their security posture. Um, from their numbers, they've found that uh, Workspaces has allowed them to save 30% of their desktop operating costs and 70% uh, on their capital expenditures. So that's, uh, that's what we like to hear. All right, moving into, uh, into WorkDocs. So for user data and collaboration, WorkDocs integrates very easily with the Workspaces environment. Um, I, a lot of times, will use WorkDocs as a migration tool to go from a physical system into, uh, into Workspaces. Um, we have virtual desktop uh, user storage and team collaboration. Uh, one example, we've got uh, Halliburton, uh, has the Open Earth community. It's a, a set of engineer, it's an engineering community. They share large data sets and documents, and they're running through, uh, through WorkDocs for that. Um, WorkDocs gives you that uh, rich collaboration and sharing tools anywhere access. There's a, a sync client, uh, a WorkDocs drive that actually looks like a drive letter on if you're using it with, uh, with workspaces. There's also just general web access so you can access those synchronized files from, from anywhere. Uh, again, easy to integrate. In addition to being able to uh, just spin up and, and distribute services, we also give you APIs to build access and permission controls so you can build document management systems with, uh, with WorkDocs. Uh, when you use the two together, you get a 50 gig free tier for the workspace user. You can upgrade a user to a terabyte of WorkDocs quota for $2 a month. Um, and then you can use WorkDocs Drive as a default storage solution on that workspace. Again, it just shows up like a drive letter. That only works, the WorkDocs Drive piece only works in a, in a workspace. For the regular client, you'd use a, a sync capability. All right, and that brings us to AppStream 2.0. AppStream 2.0 is uh, the, the application streaming service where, where Workspaces gives you the full desktop. AppStream is really delivering a set of managed applications to those end users. Again, there's no infrastructure to manage. You simply create the image, set some parameters for instance sizing, the minimum uh, desired and maximum number of streaming instances in the fleet, and the AppStream service provisions and deprovisions instances as necessary to, uh, to address your user capacity. It's pay-as-you-go, it's a pure usage model, so you're paying for resources needed uh, based on the hours that the users are connected. Uh, services are accessed through a browser over HTTPS, they're SSL encrypted, so again, security, number one focus. Uh, your, your users have that encrypted session, uh, bits stream down to the, the client, and, uh, and you know, keyboard and mouse go up. And when I say client, it's just a web browser. There's nothing for them to download, nothing to install. You just need a modern HTML5 web browser. You just connect and go. It couldn't be any easier. Um, global scalability, we, uh, I'll go into the regions where all these services are available, but you can very easily copy those, uh, those services out to other regions with, uh, with AppStream 2. And we have uh, a handful of different mechanisms for access. You can use a custom identity provider. You can integrate through user pools. Uh, user pools are by region. Or you can, uh, you can, if you already have a directory service, you can use SAML 2.0 authentication to use existing identities that, uh, that you may already have in your corporate environment. Um, when you're using SAML, you can actually domain join those fleets. Domain join fleets can be managed with standard Windows tools, such as group policy settings and so on. So a lot of those same capabilities. I did want to mention the protocol. For, uh, for AppStream 2.0 is from NICE. It's called NICE DCV. So it varies a little uh, from Workspaces, which is the Teradici PC over IP. So benefits of AppStream 2, you can import your applications with no changes, no rewrites, um, no, no special uh, uh, tricks to be able to get things running, and I'll hopefully be able to show that in the demo later. You just do a, you, you connect to a Windows desktop, run a native install, and point the wizard to the shortcut for the application that you want to be able to, uh, to publish in the AppStream. Again, AppStream integrates with your existing apps, identity, entitlements, and backend. So it runs in a VPC. You have access to anything that you can access through that VPC, whether it's uh, you know, other peered VPCs, other AWS services, or on-premises um, systems. There's no hardware or software to install. You simply add your applications and start streaming. And it is one streaming instance per user with no shared instances. The difference in the, uh, the one streaming instance here is that these are non-persistent uh, instances. So when a user connects, Every time that user reconnects, they're going to get a clean instance. 
use cases for, for AppStream uh, you know, across business and public sector. It's a great way to take standard off-the-shelf applications and webify them, like make them something that you can deliver to your user through a web browser without any rewrites. Also, a lot of opportunities for ISVs to, uh, to write their applications, to provide demos, to, to push um, access out to customers through, through AppStream without having to worry about what's the underlying hardware that the customer is running. Uh, workshops and e-learning environments, uh, it's a great way to, uh, to conduct training. You, you have a known state. You, uh, you, you always know that my app stream on any system that has a web browser that runs HTML5 can run this regardless of the underlying capabilities of that hardware. So it makes that training environment a lot easier to set up. If you've ever tried to do a, a training model where people bring their own equipment, you, all, you inevitably have, oh, I don't have a, a connector for that monitor. Mine only uses HDMI, uh, you know, micro HDMI connectors. None of that is an issue with, uh, <laughs> with this model for delivery. We have multiple instance families for AppStream 2.0. Uh, there's uh, general compute. That's your standard knowledge worker apps, your general office applications. There's compute optimized fleets that uh, give you uh, higher performance systems, more processing power for compute bound applications. There are memory optimized fleets. If you're doing a lot of in-memory processes, processing large data sets or you know, uh, tableau visualizations, things like that's where the uh, memory optimized comes in. And then there are graphics optimized for those high graphics requirements. Within graphics, we actually have three separate families. The, uh, the graphics design is powered by AMD's, I have to look at my notes for this one, AMD's Fire Pro S7150X2 GPUs. So that gives you a graphics processing capability for um, DirectX, OpenGL, OpenCL, but not CUDA. And you know, applications that'll run in that space include uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, Autodesk Revit, and uh, Siemens NX. We have the graphics desktop family. We have uh, one instance type there that's based um, on the G2 instance fleet. You'll see the same, um, same type of capability with GPU workspaces. It has a, an NVIDIA K520 GPU. So that's if you're, if you're looking for CUDA capabilities, you'd look at either the graphics desktop or graphics pro. Graphics pro, uh, that one is using the, uh, the Tesla M60. So instance sizes there go up to 64 VP CPUs and uh, uh, almost half a terabyte of, uh, of system memory with 32 gigs of, uh, of graphics memory. So that's ideal for those graphics workloads that require just a massive amount of that parallel processing capability for 3D rendering, visualization. So this will be applications such as uh, Petrel's Petroleum Exploration and Production Software from, from um, Schlumberger, uh, Landmark's Decision Space, or uh, Motion DSP's Ikena for, uh, for real-time video enhancement analysis. I don't know how to use any of those products, so I'm gonna show you how to render a toy helicopter later. That's all I got. <laughs> so customer success stories, uh, Aviva with AppStream 2.0, uh, they're able to configure a single instance of their E3D software, and that's uh, everything 3D. It's, a, it's an on-demand self-training platform. And they can deliver that to any number of engineers training with their uh, Aviva experience anywhere in the world. Because AppStream runs in the browser, they don't need to worry about configuring and securing those systems. They can immediately allow people to start learning that E3D product with a responsive, fluid experience. And this is my favorite line that is indistinguishable from a native installation on a workstation. Warms my heart. <clears throat> All right, deployment considerations. So now we're going to start tying into the, to the, uh, the products and show what we might actually do in a, a real world scenario. So in this use case, we're looking at an existing AWS customer, a hybrid architecture with a mix of applications on premises and in the cloud. We have an existing Active Directory environment for identity. Uh, we're going to assume AWS Direct Connect is already in place. And for this, uh, I've, I've assumed 4,000 users. But really, if you change the, uh, the user size anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands, the main things that you're changing are um, you know, CIDR blocks, you know, how big of a subnet are you using? And then uh, what, uh, what do you use for directory services in the, in the tools that require directory? You know, do you size it as a small or a large? Do you have multiple segments of those directory services? But it's a fairly scalable model. I just picked 4,000 because uh, it was easy to work with at the time. 30% contingent workforce, it's about 1,200 users. 10% uh, with high performance or GPU workloads, so about 400 of your users. And then all of the same requirements that we had for those uh, um, end user environments. And we're looking at user segmentation. We'll say there are a vast majority of them are standard office users, accounting, marketing, risk management, et cetera. Um, your engineering users, your data scientists, your GIS folks, those are in that 10% uh, that, that high performance. So the approach, and obviously, 
you know, this is, we're talking end user computing, right? So I'm going to have to oversimplify things a bit here. I only have an hour. Uh, these types of product projects, these assessments take, you know, weeks and months to figure out even what your data, your uh, user segmentation looks like. But, you know, you've got to think about that user segmentation, select your initial use cases. So what are your main drivers, right? Think about the, the user experience. Do you have concerns with asset management for those contingent workforces? And I've worked at places where, you know, if we bring a contractor in, it wasn't uncommon for them to sit there for a week or two weeks until we got them systems um, because we just didn't have a, a, a fast process for getting that new hardware in place if we didn't have any in the inventory closet. Um, and then how did we reclaim them at the end? You know, how do you, when, uh, when somebody spins off of a project, do they know where to bring those assets to hand them back in or do they just walk off with your corporate asset? Uh, do your engineering workers complain that they need more powerful systems to support some of their applications versus what you distribute as your, your standard image? Are your developers regularly requesting systems with higher specs than what you provision? Um, you, could you use workspaces or AppStream to offer better performance or simplify the experience for home office users versus what you have to do today to manage a VPN, um, all the security posturing for, for remote access solutions? These are just some of the elements that can kind of go into that decision. Uh, making process, how do you establish that success criteria up front, right? Is it based on user acceptance? Is it a reduction in cost? Is it some other aspect? Think about those and, and use those characteristics to build your pilot solution and run that user acceptance testing. And this is AWS, so once you deploy, it's easy to iterate. Uh, you can make changes to the fleet size and app stream uh, by simply stopping the fleet, cha you know, changing the instance type. You can make changes to the, uh, the workspace size um, in the console, you can, you, if you've put everybody out there as standard and you realize you have a group of users that perhaps have a little bit higher needs, you can bump them up to, uh, to performance. If you deployed a bunch of people as power users and you see that maybe that's a little too much for them, you can bump them back down. Okay, so the first step in your implementation is always going to be a account structure. I always recommend a payer and linked account structure and we've got a lot of documentation out there on how to manage uh, multi-account structures for either security or performance or, or standardization. Uh, so I recommend looking at some of those, uh, you know, those architectural guidelines. Uh, we also have AWS organizations, which makes it an easy way to use service control policies to, uh, to control um, you know, rights and accesses across multiple accounts. But uh, what I like to do is central logging in a payer account and then your user environment in a separate account. And I always recommend a separate account because accounts give you a distinct administrative boundary. Your DBAs are very seldom also your uh, end user um, administrators. Your end user administrators very seldom have anything to do with your web servers, right? So there's no reason for people to be in an account where they would have potentially access to those things. And you can build the complex IAM policies to manage that as well. Um, but that distinct account boundary makes it really clean, really easy to see you know, what's in here, who has access, what can they do. So generally, I'll recommend a shared services environment. That's the, uh, the block in the middle there. Things like Active Directory, multi-factor authentication, ADFS, those sit in the shared services VPC. Um, and then whatever you do for breaking out your other accounts, whether it's by environment type, like dev and prod is shown here, or if it's by departmental separation, or I've even seen uh, some customers that do legacy as one account and cloud first as another. I kind of like that model because it lets you see where your costs are allocated. The, the key is to have your workspaces and app stream set up in their own account. You can use VPC peering, VPN connectivity, or, or, or whatever to, uh, to give access to those other uh, accounts as needed. So from account structure, we move on to some network design decisions. So in our use case, I started with saying we had about 4,000 users. So that's a minimum VPC CIDR block of uh, slash 20, 4096. That's two slash 21s, so uh, 2048 addresses a piece. While that would be sufficient for our current needs, you don't always want to build just for your current needs. If you want to allow for future growth, maybe start with a slash 19 that gives you 8,100 addresses and then subdivide. So two slash 21s for workspaces, two slash 22s for app stream, and there's a slash 21 left over. This is going to take some whiteboarding with your network engineers. Uh, if you have plenty of IP space available, you can start with a bigger block. Uh, if you're trying to uh, re reserve IP space, you really want to make sure you've planned that out. If you grow beyond the boundaries of your original VPC, we do support adding uh, new ranges, uh, adding additional CIDR blocks to a VPC. Uh, and then some base requirements that we have for across the products, Workspaces always requires two subnets in different availability zones. AppStream can be deployed in a single subnet, but we would never recommend that, so uh, deploy it across two subnets in different availability zones. 
And size those subnets, again, to accommodate your target end state capacity, not necessarily what you're doing right now. All right, so we've set up the account. We have our networking defined. Uh, we've had the whiteboarding session with the engineers. We've come up with the VPC setup. We've created the subnets. Now what? So what do we need to know about the networking interfaces? In both services, we have two network interfaces. ETH0 is the service interface. So again, on AppStream, that's nice DCV. And on workspaces, that's Teradici PC over IP. Um, all service traffic runs through ETH0. You don't have access to that, uh, that network interface. ETH1 is the interface in your VPC. So that's going to get an IP address from the range that you define. And um, that is where you'll set security groups and rules and so on. Uh, routing rules and security groups affect ETH1. You have full control over that interface. So if your VPC can access your on-premises network, you can give that access for your workspaces users to your app stream sessions. User traffic can route to file servers, backend databases, licensing servers, and so on, um, however you've connected, as long as there is a route from your VPC. So after deciding on the, uh, the network, we move to user access and directory integration. So with workspaces, all workspaces are joined to an active directory domain. Um, directory services, AWS directory service, is required to connect to the Amazon workspace. That's because the directory service is where we get the registration code. Registration code is the same for all users in a directory for workspaces. AppStream, your fleets can be domain joined or standalone. For our purposes, we're going to talk about domain joined fleets. Uh, domain joined fleets integrate via SAML <clears throat> with your identity provider. So you can certainly reach back to uh, on-prem AD controllers, uh, you know, reach across the, uh, uh, onto your on-premises network. Uh, but I always recommend extending your AD environment into AWS on EC2 instances. And the reason for that is because most of your traffic outside of the initial authentication to a workspace is native AD traffic. So all of your group policy communication and all of that, um, you know, if you have a site defined that is in AWS, it's close to your, your systems. You're going to keep that traffic constrained and within your, your VPC. Uh, so I recommend using cross-account VPC peering for communications to that shared services VPC. Define those VPCs in Active Directory sites and services. I can't tell you the number of times people will build the, uh, the AD infrastructure in, uh, in AWS and then not add the IP ranges to the sites and services so the traffic still goes uh, long haul. Um, and you know, you'll have GPO uh, application timing out, things like that. It all comes back to that AD uh, communication uh, definition. And then I always recommend separating Active Directory OUs by service and region. So separate organizational units for your workspaces, then from your uh, AppStream instances, and separate those by region so you can apply different policies, different group policy settings as necessary. All right, so let's get into a demo. All right, so first we're gonna connect to a workspace. Now what I've done here, um, I've actually used a, a common home share mapping between my workspace and my app stream session. I've started with a, I think this is a standard workspace unless I upgraded it and forgot to, uh, to downgrade it. I sometimes do that during demos. Um, this, uh, it's definitely not a GPU workspace, so that's the, the key piece. So I'm gonna show the, uh, drive mappings here, I've got an H drive that has my source files, my output files, and some shared files because I've tied in with, uh, uh, with work docs. So from the workspace, if I try to run Blender, it's gonna give me this error. Your system doesn't use hardware acceleration. Blender requires a graphics driver with OpenGL 2.1 support. Do not have that. Maybe caused by a missing or faulty graphics driver installation, check. Accessing Blender through a remote connection, check. Or using Blender through a virtual machine, check. So I have failed every option that they give me there for running Blender on a workspace. So instead, I will jump off to an AppStream session. Now, you'll notice uh, I'm us you saw an Okta logo pop up there. I'm using Okta's integrated Windows authentication agent to pass through that initial authentication to the actual AppStream session and take me directly into the app. Because this is a domain joined instance though, we still get this pop-up for just the user's password. And that's because we can't pass a password over SAML and we can't have an interactive Windows login without a password or a smart card, but we don't support smart cards. So password it is, so we have to prompt for that password. And we'll now connect to that, uh, to that app stream session. It's gonna resize to my browser. I'm gonna make it resize again by going full screen on my desktop. All right. And give me 
me just a second. We'll go full screen for, uh, for the app stream session. And I have a black screen. Awesome. All right, so we'll start Blender from here. Uh, this is happening because I uh, connected to the demo, but I didn't give it enough time to shut down um, before, uh, before coming to the room here. My screen size is way off. Oh man, that's a, uh, see I told you, we did not appease the demo gods uh, early on here. Let me uh, disconnect and reconnect that one. All right, so what I'm trying to show here is this will actually give you the ability to spin off to a, a, a GPU enabled app stream session. I can run that Blender application, and since I've already authenticated, hopefully it won't uh, prompt me for all that again. It will. Um, you, can, uh, you can run those, those graphics intensive applications in the app stream session and have access to those, uh, the files, the source files from the H drive. So back on the workspace, I have the, um, yeah, I showed you the H drive where we had the files. We'll go to, uh, to open files here in Blender. Smaller screen than I normally am in. Here's my user share, H. So we'll go to the uh, Blender file. Here's the helicopter that I mentioned earlier. And this is a, a GPU-enabled session. But first, I'm gonna start rendering with just compute. I wanna kinda show you the difference between uh, uh, compute capability and, and GPU rendering. So you can't really read it because it's, uh, it's you know, speckled at the top in tiny font. But right now it's showing I have a remaining time of four minutes and 25 seconds to complete that render because I'm using CPU-based rendering. So I'm gonna go ahead and kill that session. Under File, User Preferences, System, we can change uh, Blender to use GPU rendering. So we'll go to CUDA Processing. You see the Tesla M60 display. I'm running on a, a Graphics Pro stack. So we'll save that setting. All right, and then we will re-render. What we should see here is a remaining time of 20 seconds. So significant difference in whether you're using the CPU capabilities or GPU rendering capabilities for these types of graphics applications. So now once that has finished rendering, um, I have an output directory going to my H drive. Um, screen's a little small. You can usually see that down in here, but it's a bit compressed. So we'll go back to the workspace. And under renders, we can see that uh, at 4.23, which is the current system time, uh, that render file was dropped there. You can now open this on your workspace and continue on with whatever your general workflow would be uh, for post-processing or sending that on for approvals from your legal committee. You know, is this the right helicopter? Does it have too many sharp edges? Whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you can, uh, you can just spawn off to AppStream for the sessions that, the components of the session that require those special processing capabilities. All right, so what does that all look like in the console? We're gonna exit the uh, workspace session here. So here is, uh, here's that workspace in the console. You can see it's running a performance, uh, it was based on a performance workspace. Um, yeah, so I didn't, uh, didn't downgrade it the last time, it's still running, uh, running performance, but I can show you within, uh, within actions, I'm actually gonna do that. This is my admin here, J.A. Ferris, me. So uh, currently running standard, that doesn't sound like the sort of thing that I would do for me as an administrator. I want the biggest system available, so I'm gonna modify that workspace, change compute type, set that to power, because that's the biggest we currently offer, and uh, it will initiate a, a process to upgrade that workspace. Now, um, the user can be connected when you do this. It will disconnect them, but uh, you don't have to set the workspace to, workstation to stop mode or anything else. The next time uh, after that uh, connection has completed, after that upgrade's completed, they'll be able to log in, same user data, same system drive, um, you know, just a uh, upgraded underlying instance. On a workspace, you have uh, two volumes. There's a system volume that's based on uh, whatever you apply as the image. So we can see over here, I have a demo image that I'm using as the, uh, the custom bundle that I'm applying to those workspaces. We used to require that you create a, a bundle for every different hardware platform, and you still can. So you can say that you know, my standard users all have a standard demo bundle, whatever. Um, you can set that up and then upgrade them independently. 
Uh, you used to have to have a bundle for performance, a bundle for standard, and you had to make those decisions at the point of deployment. But in December of last year, we released that capability to modify those running bundles. You can now make those decisions kind of case by case without creating a disruptive user experience. When you rebuild a, a, a workspace, it will always use the latest image that's assigned to that bundle, and it will reattach the user's data volume. Those data volumes are snapped every, uh, every 12 hours, so you get a snapshot of that drive. Uh, user data is retained through that snapshot. It's non-deterministic, so if, uh, if the user was just doing a whole lot of you know, really high-end engineering work and they saved a lot of important documents, I wouldn't recommend doing a rebuild until they've been you know, disconnected for 12 hours. You can see that information through the CloudWatch metrics. Uh, but when you, uh, if you rebuild, reattach, it will automatically reattach that user's data volume. So there's uh, workspaces. Now, one of the other things to notice in workspaces, and I talked about the uh, elastic network interfaces. Here we have 10.0.11.10 as the, uh, the workspace IP for this one. Uh, there's the registration code, by the way. If, if you uh, need to find the reg code, you've lost the email, it's going to be the same for all users in your directory. It sits right there. All right, so under your EC2 console, you can search elastic network interfaces for that address. And you can see the description is created by Amazon Workspaces for AWS Workspaces. Uh, sorry, for AWS, and it'll give the account number. Shows you the status. Shows the, uh, the matching private IP address. This is where you can do things like manage security groups that are applied to that ENI. So if, for example, you have a, a help desk process that requires RDPing into those workspace sessions, this is where you could, you know, during the point where you're troubleshooting that system, go in add the workspace to an RDP open group and then allow access for your help desk to be able to remote into that system. All right, so that's the workspaces console. What does AppStream look like? So here is, uh, here's our AppStream console. You're generally gonna start on images with AppStream and under image builder. So just to kind of show what the administrative process looks like for, uh, for AppStream, it, it, is, it is an in-browser capability, same as actually connecting to AppStream. So you simply select your image builder in the console and hit connect. Here we go, we didn't get the black screen. <laughs> uh, here is the, uh, you, you see a full desktop experience for server 2008, uh, sorry, 2012 R2. And the image assistant, uh, that is the icon on the desktop that you'll actually use to add applications to your AppStream instance. So now I've already installed Sublime Text under the C apps directory so I can find it. We'll pick that from here just to show what the interface looks like. Here's the display name, here's the path. You can set any launch parameters or working directories that you'd wanna set. Save and it shows up like a shortcut. You continue to add applications that way and then uh, you'll walk through a test and, and optimized process and then build an image. Um, like I said, super straightforward. No custom coding, no reworking, no plugins, no anything special you need to do other than install the application, point to the shortcut and wrap up the image. Within the, uh, the AppStream console then you'll take that image, apply it to a fleet uh, we have always on and on demand fleets. On demand fleets, again, take a little bit longer to start up because we'll build the fleet for capacity in the background and then we'll, uh, we'll suspend it waiting for those user connections. Um, most use cases, except when you're up on stage doing a demo, I'd recommend probably using the, uh, the on demand type. Um, always on, always keeps a minimum number of systems running in the background. Um, so just waiting for those user connections, but it's uh, you know, the difference between an instant connection and a, and a minute connection. Uh, and you can see the fleet characteristics down below. Um, you can see the, uh, the instance types that we built on. This is a Graphics Pro 4XL. Uh, fleet type is always on. The directory configuration that I used, the OU where those systems will, uh, will be dropped. If you go into your AD management tools, you can go in and see the ones that are running. We stamp the descriptions with the, whether it's an image builder, what fleet it's associated with, and so on. This is also where you can see your fleet usage. So you can see I've been connecting and disconnecting, uh, you know, both prepping for this demo and actually giving the demo. So we'll see here um, you know, the capacity that I had available, the in-use capacity, and uh, capacity utilization. You actually set your scaling policies based on that capacity utilization. So right now I've got the fleet configured for a minimum capacity of two. Since this is an always-on fleet, that means I'm always running two instances. I have a scale out policy once I've connected uh, to both of those instances that'll push me to 100% utilization so that exceeds my 75% threshold. It will add two instances. If I disconnect uh, down to 25% uh, of that capacity, it will scale in by one instance at a time. All right, 
And then stacks, stacks are where you actually generate uh, user access to those systems. So in this case, all of my stacks are based on um, you know, domain joined instances. They're all, uh, they're all SAML based. So I've created those out in Okta to, uh, to provide that, uh, that access into the systems. Um, we also have uh, recently launched custom branding. So if, when I logged in, you saw the AppStream 2 interface. If you want that to be you know, badging that's unique to your company, you can, uh, you can configure that here. And when you exit the session, uh, we offer two different landing pages, uh, one that can redirect back to you know, just a general IT page, or if you want to collect like a user feedback survey, you can enable or disable that uh, capability as well. All right. Okay, and uh, I had talked about uh, WorkDocs being integrated into that workspace. So I have installed WorkDocs uh, pointing to the H drive over here. So if we look at, uh, at that setup, you'll see the uh, upload happened seven minutes ago. I deleted uh, um, you know, the file that I was then going to render a couple of hours ago. After we created it, it dropped it into that shared directory. WorkDocs picked it up, loaded it into, uh, into the WorkDocs session. You'll see that my, uh, my WorkDocs environment mirrors what you see right here. Uh, shared with me is a WorkDocs collaboration feature, so you won't actually see that directory um, in there, but it's, uh, it shows up under shared. You can see here the uh, render file. That's the helicopter that we used for the demo. And the, uh, the Blender output. I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, that's the render file, and the PNG was the, uh, the actual output file. So changes that you make here will replicate down to that H drive. Um, you know, changes that you make on the H drive will replicate up to the service, and uh, that gives you a way to easily move data between all three services. So you have it available wherever you are, whatever device, whether you're accessing it through a workspace, whether you're accessing it through a, uh, a tablet, through anything else. It makes it very straightforward and easy to, uh, to transfer that data between our services. All right. With that, um, our global availability, we have workspaces in 10 regions now, and it's uh, just a little indicator for how fast, uh, how fast we move. Um, I have had to check this deck in three times now just because of changes that we've made in the last uh, couple of weeks. We now have 10 workspaces regions, Virginia, Oregon, Seoul, Ireland, Frankfurt, London, Singapore, Sydney, Tokyo, and Sao Paulo. We have seven regions for AppStream 2. That's Virginia, Oregon, Ireland, Frankfurt, Singapore, Sydney, and Tokyo. Uh, so you can easily spin services up in those new regions in response to things like um, you know, business needs, mergers and acquisitions, or employee movement. Uh, if you're interested in trying any of these services now, we have a free tier for workspaces. So you can run two standard bundle workspaces for 40 hours a month, up to two calendar months. Uh, it's the Windows 7 or Windows 10 experience, and that includes uh, a WorkDocs 50 gig instance so tied in with that workspace. Uh, there's a 30-day free, free tier for WorkDocs it's a mouthful, with one terabyte of storage per user for up to 50 users. Uh, workspaces users will receive access to WorkDocs at no additional charge. You can upgrade them to that, uh, that one terabyte for $2 a month. And then AppStream, there's not a free tier for AppStream, but uh, you can very easily spin it up with no, uh, no setup required. Try the sample apps. You run things on the standard smaller streams. You can upload your own files, test a workflow, print, whatever you want to do uh, with, uh, with that. And with that, um, please complete the survey session in the mobile app. So I will be recording uh, a lot of this content as a uh, webinar next week. So I would really appreciate any constructive uh, criticism or feedback uh, for the content that you've seen here today. I can wrap that into, uh, into my webinar. So please, uh, please do fill out those surveys. And I'll be, uh, I'll be standing by for uh, any questions here at the end. All right? Thank you very much.